pleasure to come here to share with you some of my impressions of what I think is truly a very major uh, development uh, which has taken place in, uh, in, in the South Asian subcontinent. Uh, I guess I should first report to you that India is still there uh, since the last one who's been there always has to bring back this, uh, this assurance. And sometimes when one reads the press, you wonder uh, what exactly what the situation uh, is. Uh, I don't always agree with uh, Daniel Patrick Monaghan, uh, now Senator Monaghan, and I think he, he used rather flamboyant uh, language <coughs> shortly after the results of the Indian election were known. But I do suggest there is at least a kernel of truth uh, in these rather, uh, rather uh, grandiose uh, words when he said that nothing that will happen in Washington this year will be as important to America as what happened in New Delhi in the last few days. Political democracy uh, has uh, reasserted its claim on the future of the world. Uh, I would say there's a kernel of truth in that, in, in the sense that if we are concerned at all about the uh, future of democracy in the world, and I assume most of us are, uh, it obviously has got to be able to function in some fashion or other, some recognizable fashion, uh, embodying the fundamental principles of the uh, democratic way, uh, outside of the white Western world. And <coughs> if it is not adaptable uh, in mass societies, uh, such as uh, India, uh, where, as representing perhaps the major one outside of China, then the hopes of democracy uh, in the world generally are, are pretty uh, dim indeed. I think some extraordinary changes have occurred in both Pakistan and India uh, during the first uh, few weeks of this year, uh, 1977. These are changes which have uh, changed the political landscape, the political atmosphere, the political climate, of both countries. <clears throat> I know that Indians and Pakistanis don't always like to be compared. Perhaps I should first call attention to the fact that there are some very major differences between the Indian and the Pakistani elections. Uh, obviously, there's a very great difference in historical experience in the, uh, pol the political systems, uh, uh, in the political and social uh, uh, climate of the two countries. <coughs> Pakistan was holding its first uh, national election under a civilian government and the, only the second one it had ever held in its entire history, uh, whereas India, of course, was holding its six uh, general elections plus endless numbers of uh, state and uh, other elections. The size of the operation was obviously very, very different. There were about uh, 30 million uh, eligible voters uh, in Pakistan and some 320 million eligible voters in India and actually 193 million or so voted. The turnout in both countries was about uh, about 60 percent <coughs> and quite obviously the elections in Pakistan were, were rougher I can uh, vouch for that myself, having been there. Uh, there was a somewhat different atmosphere, and uh, even more obviously, uh, the aftermath of the two elections has been very different. We don't know what the future will hold, but uh, it's quite clear that the immediate aftermath of the election in India was what I would call, as a political scientist, uh, <coughs> fairly uh, peaceful and stabilizing. In other words, it seemed to be a stabilizing election, even though it did uh, usher in a rather major uh, political change. Whereas, uh, quite obviously, the election in uh, Pakistan, which had a very different uh, result, that is, the, 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 the uh, ruling party, the PPP, and the top leader, Mr. Bhutto, uh, <coughs> won a, uh, an overwhelming uh, majority at the polls, whereas Mrs. Gandhi in the Congress uh, 
did not have that, uh, that good fortune. But <coughs> at the same time, the elections in Pakistan, even though they seem to consolidate uh, the power, and I suppose Mr. Buddha would also say would had to re-legitimized uh, the regime, and nevertheless it's quite obviously had destabilizing effects. All you have to do is read the newspapers uh, to realize the, the, uh, the traumas that Pakistan has had to uh, endure uh, in the uh, weeks that have followed the national election of March 7 and the <coughs> rather farcical uh, elections to the provincial assembly on March 10. I say farcical because of the fact that the PNA, the leading opposition alliance, the nine-party coalition, uh, boycotted the national, the, the provincial assembly elections on the grounds that the national assembly elections of March 7th had been, had been rigged. They were screaming that, by the way, before the elections, and they screamed it even louder uh, during and immediately after the elections, so that <coughs> the provincial assembly elections couldn't have been uh, anything but farcical, no matter what Mr. Budo tried to do, uh, give, given the circumstances as they existed. But you, you have had quite different results for the time being. Uh, apparently <coughs> stabilizing in India and uh, obviously uh, destabilizing in the case of Pakistan. Uh, we shouldn't draw too many conclusions from that, though, should we? Because we don't know what the longer range result will be, either of the government that's coming to power in, uh, in India, a coalition government, or the government which is trying to stay on in power, the PPP government under Mr. Bhutto in, in, in Pakistan. I think in some ways the most uh, impressive uh, thing about uh, these uh, elections in both countries is what I would call the, the two waves. It's interesting to, uh, to watch waves, whether they're the waves of the ocean or, or waves of political opinion. <coughs> they become very important psychological facts. I've seen that before on a limited scale. Certainly in India, there were a number of cases where you had a very strong either pro-Congress wave in certain parts of the country at least, or an anti-Congress wave in certain parts of the country. And oftentimes that psychological uh, tide or psychological wave has been <coughs> a very decisive factor in determining the results of the vote in particular parts of the country. Now, <coughs> in both Pakistan and India, you had these waves. I've never seen stronger waves in the, in the, in the political sense. The, 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 you, you, you could feel it. As, uh, as soon as I got to Pakistan, it was, I'd read about it and I was aware of it, but it was, became so obvious just as I watched and uh, talked and studied <coughs> and tried to absorb something of the atmosphere of the country. And as soon as I got to India, after the Pakistanis were through voting, I had the same feeling in India, you know, the, uh, the, it, it's a very, very strong wave. Now, what, what were these waves? They, they were <coughs> essentially anti-government and uh, anti-authoritarian uh, waves. They <coughs> were waves of uh, protest against all kinds of things. Uh, sometimes they were uh, evidenced by uh, protests against uh, immediate abuses uh, against uh, immediate, uh, on, on, on occasioned by immediate issues. And in other cases, they were occasioned by uh, what one could almost suggest as uh, strong feelings with regard to uh, political uh, philosophy. <coughs> For example, in, in, in India, I found it hard to believe that when Jay Prakash Narayan was talking about the issue being democracy versus dictatorship, but that would mean very much in the Indian environment, especially among the masses of the people. I must say I was uh, convinced against my, my natural inclination to be suspicious of uh, how deep-seated these feelings are by the <coughs> fairly obvious fact that lots and lots of people said in effect that just because we are poor do you think we do not pri prize freedom. And that's rather an extraordinary thing when you try to translate into terms that those of you from India would well understand, the, uh, the villager, the pr uh, people in the rural areas, or for that matter, uh, in the cities. It, <coughs> it was much more than a, an attitude of certain disgruntled intellectuals or frustrated dissidents. It, uh, it was much more deep-seated than that, 
and it, it, it was really a very major uh, psychological phenomenon uh, in these uh, two elections. Now, <coughs> why did Mrs. Gandhi call these elections? I guess she's asking herself that question at the moment. Uh, and, and you can give all kinds of answers to that. Uh, you may recall that uh, a few weeks before that, in November, uh, she had decided against calling the elections. And <coughs> it was rumored at that time that about 150 of the 350 Congress members of the Lok Sabha, the lower house of Indian parliament, had advised her to hold elections. But that <coughs> in spite of this advice, for various reasons, she decided that uh, there would not be elections uh, and they would be postponed at least for another year. Well, why then, uh, on January 18th, did she announce that elections would be held? I, I don't know the answer to that. Quite obviously, she had reassessed the situation, perhaps because pressures were building up for her to do so, perhaps because she felt that there would never be a better time, uh, the economic situation was rather good, uh, perhaps it wouldn't be good in the future, uh, <coughs> there might be more difficulty as time went on, this might be a good time uh, to go to the people to re-legitimize re her regime, and I can't imagine that she had much doubt that uh, she would be successful and would get, uh, would, would continue in power. I mean, quite obviously, she would have probably found some way not to hold them if she was quite convinced that the results would be uh, what they were. <coughs> but the, the reasons that have been given for her decision uh, range all the way from uh, some, one didn't told me, uh, Jimmy Carter is responsible. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Uh, <coughs> that he's responsible for Mrs. Gandhi, I guess because they said, well, he's talking all the time about democracy and all that kind of stuff, and Mrs. Gandhi now is going to show him that She's a Democrat, too, that <coughs> he's misread her, <coughs> and that, of course, uh, Mr. Budo took credit for Mrs. Gandhi's decision to hold the election. Uh, when uh, uh, immediately after Mr. Gandhi announced the decision, uh, he pointed out that he'd, uh, he had announced the election in Pakistan January 7th, so he beat her by 11 days, <coughs> and he announced that this was the first time that Pakistan had been able to influence a decision by India, and he hoped it would set a precedent for the future. So he took some credit. Uh, <coughs> later on, incidentally, that boomerang, because <coughs> if there was, say, a Pakistani influence on the, on the calling of the election, then there certainly was an Indian influence on what happened in Pakistan, at least in two rather important respects later on. <coughs> one was, as uh, one of my Pakistani friends wrote to me after the election, uh, many of us are asking, why is it that India can hold free and fair elections that we can't? Uh, and of course, uh, even more importantly, uh, what is now being referred to as the Indian example, uh, perhaps will also be, in, be the example which Pakistan too will follow, which will not keep, make Mr. Bhutto feel very happy in view of what happened to Mrs. Gandhi. <coughs> there was a very, uh, there was a cartoon by my favorite cartoonist, who many of you know, Lakshman of the Times of India, uh, <coughs> after the Pakistan election, which went overwhelmingly, of course, in favor of Bhutto and the PPP, and it, maybe you saw it, it showed <coughs> Bhutto on the telephone to Mrs. Gandhi, and he said, you know, you can have a wave here and still win too, that was the, that was the verdict. <coughs> so maybe Mrs. Gandhi thought, well, maybe this wave here in, in, in India, well, look what happened in Pakistan, there was a wave in Pakistan, and Bhutto swept the field, so perhaps I can do that also in, uh, in India. Well, there are many other reasons why uh, that were ascribed to Mrs. Gandhi's calling the elections. I was told by some that it was the military who had uh, advised her or ordered her or what have you to hold the elections. And I guess the <coughs> most logical explanation I heard was it was her astrologer who decided that uh, <coughs> they should have elections. So I'm rather inclined under circumstances like this to uh, give the obvious explanation, namely that the the uh, feeling that there should be elections was growing. Mrs. Gandhi felt she was in a pretty strong position. She had uh, done a great deal during the emergency. Uh, there was some disadvantage of continuing certain types of controls which perhaps could be now be relaxed. And if she got a, uh, a, an additional mandate, then that should help to still any claims that she was just ruling in an arbitrary fashion. And that uh, perhaps she would feel uh, more willing to relax some of the more unpopular controls uh, 
extreme controls of the press, uh, uh, arrests without uh, uh, trial, and some of the other things which were most grating on the people. So I suspect one doesn't have to be quite as sophisticated in <coughs> seeking an answer to this question as to why she uh, held elections as, as, as some of the pundits have uh, uh, tried to be. The effect of the announcement of the elections, however, was really extraordinary. <clears throat> in a sense, in both India and Pakistan, there were two waves. The first wave came after the uh, announcement of the elections and the partial lifting of the emergency in each, in each country. The emergency was not completely ended, as you know, either in Pakistan or India, but it was partially lifted. The freedom of assembly was allowed, campaigning. Some of these restrictions were, were at least uh, uh, relaxed. And <clears throat> that created a wholly different atmosphere. There were some who still didn't believe it or still felt rather fearful and therefore were perhaps uh, still uh, pretty discreet to the extent to which they would test this uh, newfound uh, freedom of theirs. But uh, in India, the newspapers, which uh, might be regarded as the bellwether of what is happening, really b came alive again. With all due respect to the Indian papers, I must say the ones that I've been reading uh, uh, were hardly worth reading for about 19 months. <coughs> and uh, they had been worth reading before, and, they, and they're worth reading again. It was quite a uh, marked change in that. There were some papers, from just citing the English press, which kept at least a certain amount of uh, balance and showed a high degree of courage, uh, even during the emergency. Uh, the one that is always given credit by those who want to give credit for this kind of thing is the Indian Express, which is the largest circulation of any English language publication, has something like, what is it, eight editions or something like eight, eight, or, eight or nine editions in different parts of the country. <coughs> and occasionally the statesman was given some compliment on that, but not the Times of India, not the Hindu, uh, not some of these other very, very, uh, very, very good uh, papers. But after the announcement of the elections, even these other papers began to get back to their, to their, to their better form. And you had a few uh, uh, publications which actually flip-flopped. For example, uh, my favorite Indian publication, Blitz. <coughs> now, believe it or not, Blitz, which of course had just been going down the line for the Congress, suddenly became anti-Congress. <coughs> I, I met Mr. Karangia, who I've known for many years, and I said, well, what happened to you? And he looked me in the eye and said, Sanjay, <coughs> <coughs> which I guess is as good an explanation as any. I must say that in Pakistan, this did not happen. Even after the uh, relaxation occurred, the, <coughs> the English language press and most of the Urdu press, I can't speak for the uh, other language presses, still were pretty much, uh, were hardly more than propaganda organs of the PPP. And incidentally, that is still true. I'm really amazed <coughs> that papers like Dawn, the Pakistan Times, are still sounding as if they were as if the PPP was uh, uh, sure to stay in power and almost completely defending the PPP position, which I suspect is, a, at, the, at the moment, a, a losing cause. <coughs> Whereas, obviously, in the case of India, the, the uh, press is virtually free again. Uh, admittedly, there are some legislation which they still have to work on, but certainly uh, you could say that once the results of the election were known, uh, then almost complete freedom was restored again. Uh, to the Indian press. I, I realize that has to be qualified in a few ways, but just broadly, I think that is true. Because the second wave, the first one, remember, I said came after this uh, announcement of elections and a partial lifting of restrictions. <coughs> the second wave was after the results of the elections were known. And you've obviously seen a great change in India, the whole attitude there. Uh, and uh, also, uh, in a sense, a great change in Pakistan, but I would suggest that in Pakistan, this wave has continued and, in a sense, has mounted, even under the uh, uh, clamping down, under the uh, additional restrictions which Mr. Budo and the PPP have imposed because of the agitational politics being carried on in the streets with all kinds of uh, deaths and uh, arrests and disruption, almost uh, virtually paralyzing the port of Karachi for example, as a result of this uh, unfortunate aftermath of the Pakistan elections. <coughs> I'm very interested in the techniques of uh
uh, the conduct of elections in India and Pakistan. I won't bore you with these because this gets into a, the sort of the more specialized aspects of how people vote. <coughs> but I've always been excited with the idea of millions and millions of mostly uh, illiterate people exercising uh, the franchise. I mean, it's, it's uh, really quite an exciting thing if, if they can, uh, can pull it off. And <coughs> when I was w watching the first elections in India, 51, 52, and 57, it uh, was, was particularly impressive at that time because it was a relative new experience for most of the people of India. Whereas later on, they became a little bit uh, casual about it, uh, a little bit too accustomed <coughs> to voting except that this time uh, there were new and rather exciting elements, so it became, uh, became a fairly exciting uh, experience in the most parts of the country again. <coughs> but if you deal with such large subjects as the selection, well, uh, let's start first with the actual uh, uh, work that the election commission has to do, the, uh, the registration of voters, the delimitation of constituencies. Uh, and then move on through the party operations, the, the selection of uh, candidates, the actual organization for and the conduct of a political campaign over vast, uh, a, a vast country uh, with millions of potential uh, voters. The <coughs> actual arrangements for the voting, I mean, think of the endless numbers of ballot boxes and ballot papers and polling stations and polling officials uh, needed. <coughs> India this time needed about one and one half million people just to supervise the polling. You know, something like one and a half million involved just in the, in the mechanics of the voting procedure, which uh, is a lot of people, but when you think that I say 193 million or so actually voted, uh, you, you need quite a lot of people just to uh, polling officers and returning officers and all the others that are needed in, in the conduct, <coughs> not to mention uh, police and others who would be involved in one connection or another, and not to mention the, the, um, the, the party uh, uh, people, the party workers, uh, candidates, and uh, <coughs> party organization officials, and things like that. <coughs> and the actual procedures of voting, just how, I mean, how do you vote in India? <laughs> well, it's uh, fascinating to see what procedures are worked out for mostly illiterate people, as I have said. And the procedures, uh, incidentally, in regard in the, in the formal sense, were very, very similar in both India and Pakistan. That is, the, the election procedures from the work of the Election Commission, all the things that I've mentioned, and even, <coughs> even the kind of ballot papers used and the use of symbols and the use of stamps uh, to, to mark the ballot and the kind of booth you go into and the arrangement of polling stations. <coughs> Almost all of those things were in fact, the uh, photocopies of each other, as far as the, uh, as far as the procedures uh, were, uh, were concerned. And, and that's, that's a very interesting thing indeed to watch, to try to see how a job like this, the, as they like to say in India, the, you know, the world's largest democratic elections, uh, how they are actually uh, conducted, and especially <coughs> to try to figure out to what extent are these elections free and fair, or what kind of skullduggery is going on, and uh, you know, how, do you, how do you find out about it, and to what extent does it affect the vote? Uh, even more basic <coughs> would be the question, uh, which I can't answer, and I don't know that any of us can, or, you know, what does the vote mean to the Indian voters, and <coughs> what causes them to vote the way they do? Now, when you as an Indian go and cast a vote, I kind of say it myself and from sometimes to myself. What determines the way you vote when you, when you actually go to the polls and get your ballot paper and mark it and so on? Well, what, what, is the, what is the determining factor that makes you vote for Congress or the janitor or CFD in, in, in this election or whatever party um, you might vote for? Now, <coughs> the campaign was very interesting for lots of other reasons. For example, shortly after the announcement of elections occurred, as you may know, uh, one of the real veterans of the Congress party, a member of Mrs. Gandhi's own cabinet, a man who had been in virtually every cabinet since independence, Jajivan Ram, uh, India's best known political leader among the Harijans, the untouchables of India, uh, defected. He, he uh, 
announced that he was pulling out of the Congress because, as he said, Mrs. Gandhi was subverting the liberties of the Indian people. And she said, of course, in reply to that, <clears throat> well, if you felt uh, that strongly about it, why did you stay in my government uh, for 19 months? And, and I think the answer that I would have given, if I was a Jeevan Ramos, well, if I'd spoken out earlier, I'd find myself in jail. And now I can, uh, now I can take this position uh, and at least uh, uh, campaign against you uh, rather than be your guest <coughs> uh, for, for an indefinite period without trial. That may not have been the reason. Perhaps he had more, more deep-seated reasons than that. In any event, he announced the formation of a party called the Congress for Democracy. You notice he still used the Congress. Uh, in a sense, what's been happening in India is it's, it's, it's all the Congress in one way or another with, <coughs> uh, with, a, with a few, uh, <laughs> few uh, permutations and combinations. So uh, what's new, Chum, with respect to that, you might ask. In any event, this, uh, this defection to Jeevan Ram, and along with him a number of others, uh, who already were so disgruntled are, are out of favor, like Mrs. Satpati uh, and a number of others, <coughs> and uh, Bahugana and others w went out with him. This defection was really a very major cause. I, I must say I greatly underestimated it when it happened. But it, it had a profound effect on the situation in India. I, I've heard some uh, uh, <coughs> Janata leaders say that if Jajivan Ram had not pulled out, we might not have won. I thought it was rather, rather an interesting statement. Uh, he did not choose to join the Janata group, but uh, he worked closely with them so that with only a few exceptions when they just got their signals crossed, in most cases I've checked it, two or three of them, most cases just that, with only a very few exceptions, no competing candidates were put up by the two groups. In other words, where there were janitor candidates, and they put up a lot of them, there would generally not be a CFD candidate. And where there was a CFD candidate, they only put up 40 or 50 of them, there would not be a janitor candidate, and they'd support each other. So that, <coughs> in a sense, you could say that the extraordinary thing happened in India as in Pakistan, that for once, believe it or not, and I still don't believe it, the, the opposition was united and stayed united. And <clears throat> because many people <clears throat> call attention to the fact that over the years, the Congress party has never in a national election got 50% of the vote of the Indian people. That <clears throat> and some of my friends like Mito Masani and others have always tried to argue, well, really, the Congress is a minority government. But the point was that maybe they only got 40 some percent, but uh, what did Joshua Tantra party get? Uh, like you get six or eight <clears> percent. <throat> so as long as the opposition was divided, the, uh, the Congress was still in a very strong position, even though it, it did not get the majority of the votes. It, it was able to parley a less than a majority uh, into <clears throat> a very substantial majority of the seats in the uh, national parliament, in many cases amounting to three-fourths of the seats, which gave them a pretty considerable scope for doing anything they wanted to, including, alas, amending the Constitution of India <clears throat> without uh, too much uh, difficulty. But uh, th this certainly was a very important fact that the, 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 the main opposition, the uh, janitor and the CFD sort of taken together, uh, worked unitedly, generally speaking, and did so to the end. Uh, that, that certainly had a major bearing on the election results in almost uh, all parts of India where the Congress took such a bad beating. I'm talking, of course, about the in the heartland of the north, not about the south, which still remain uh, loyal, for the most part, uh, to, the, uh, to, to the Congress. Now, in Pakistan, that happened, too, and that was an even weirder coalition than the uh, Janata. <coughs> there were nine parties, a weird assortment, and they held together remarkably well, and they even got a leader who emerged, Ashka Khan, who quite clearly emerged as the most popular and most conspicuous leader of the opposition, and was beginning to gain a certain amount of charisma even and reputation, almost uh, uh, constituting a real challenge to Mr. Bhutto uh, himself, much to Mr. Bhutto's uh, distress and no doubt uh, uh, disgust. <coughs> Whereas in the case of India, you also had some rather prominent names associated with the opposition. And, and since, uh, as you know, in these countries, personalities matter so much 
It was very important for the opposition to have persons of uh, national reputation and to some extent of national stature. <coughs> it is for that reason that the claim in both India and Pakistan that there was now a genuinely national alternative had some basis, some basis. There were exceptions, for example, in Pakistan, the PNA got nowhere at all in the Northwest Frontier Province, and in some parts of uh, India, obviously, the opposition didn't get very far. But uh, generally speaking, I think there's something to that. <coughs> and just as Mrs. Gandhi was clearly the big gun on the Congress side, in fact, it uh, was really, uh, uh, really impressive how little impact even uh, rather well-known Congress leaders, Chavan and people like that, Subramaniam and others, how very little impact they made generally. They did in certain areas where they had some pockets of strength. But Mrs. Gandhi was sort of clearly the, the, uh, the main show uh, in the election campaign on in the election campaign on the uh, Congress side. You might say, what about Sanjay? Well, that, uh, <coughs> admittedly, he attracted a lot of attention, but in a somewhat different uh, connection from the way I'm discussing the thing at the, at the moment. <coughs> and the opposition is quite clear <coughs> that there were two people in the opposition in the, among the actual campaigners who uh, uh, stood out above all the rest, namely Maraji Desai uh, and Jajivan Ram. And that in addition to that, unlike in Pakistan, you had a super leader, a, 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 a guide and a conscience, uh, namely Jai Prakash Narayan. I understand that ISU uh, uh, once I had him here, and I congratulate you <coughs> uh, <coughs> for that. <coughs> I think JP's role was really extraordinary, it really was. Here, here is a, a man in his 70s, uh, uh, very ill, uh, uh, having to be on this machine and going to the hospital uh, frequently, who occasionally <coughs> came out, practically being carried to the platform and spoke quietly. If you've heard JP, you know he's a very quiet person in his speech, and <coughs> made a tremendous impact. And more than that, he, he was a super leader. He wasn't a candidate. He stood above the battle. But <coughs> whenever there was any problem of keeping this uh, rather disparate opposition together, it was to JP that people turned. And in a sense, and still in his own quiet way, with, with his moral authority and, and great reputation for integrity and, and disinterested loyalty to the country. He, in effect, knocked heads together and said, don't be silly, you do this, you do that. And even, as you know, toward the, after the uh, uh, results were known, after it was known that the opposition would be forming a government, the uh, question was, well, who would be the prime minister? And there seemed to be some uh, uh, feeling on the part of Jeevan Ram's role that perhaps he should be, and so the Maraji Desai thought he should be, and perhaps others entertained the same desire, but they were clearly the, the two to choose between. And <coughs> because they couldn't agree, <coughs> what did they do? They worked out this unique uh, kind of consensus, say, we'll refer it to Jai Prakash Ryan and of all people, J.B. Kripalani, uh, who was 88, I believe, or 89. And uh, <coughs> I admire Mr. Kripalani very much, but he's looked uh, on the point of collapse for 20 years. <coughs> and yet he, he keeps going, it's amazing. Uh, he <coughs> He, he, he got a new lease on life uh, during this period, as, as in some ways J.P. did himself. Well, that was a very, very important factor, the particular that, that Jai Prakash was there, that, he, that he, he played that role, and he did it in a way that's extraordinary. And as I say, when he talked in these rather general terms, and J.P. is uh, nothing if not general, and most of his uh, rather woolly in some ways, uh, sort of theoretical, about things like democracy and dictatorship, and I think some of us who are skeptical, well, that doesn't mean a thing to most Indians, have got now to uh, make our apologies uh, to Jai Prakash, because he wasn't thinking of it just in the general theoretical terms. He was thinking of it in terms of what democracy might mean when it, it had to do with, uh, well, here was a petty bureaucrat who uh, imposed his will on me, or he was a policeman, who, uh, or I was arrested for this, and in some particular grievance which they regarded as a violation of the basic freedoms to which they should be entitled. Now, <coughs> there were some amazingly erroneous predictions about the probable results of these elections. I, I must say it, it makes people very humble. It should make people very humble. Anyone who tried to predict the results of these elections, perhaps some of you did it too, were probably way off the mark. 
If you were even close to the mark, it was, I'm sure, just a mistake. <coughs> because it was almost impossible. Uh, what criteria could you use when you have to figure out the effects of a wave and try to analyze it in those terms? I, I could uh, cite uh, plenty of examples, including some headlines in American papers and, uh, not, and in Indian papers, for that matter, uh, which uh, uh, indicated that Mrs. Gandhi was sure to uh, win a, a pretty uh, considerable victory. There were those who didn't predict that. I think the prevailing feeling, as I gathered it, toward the end of the, uh, just a few days before the voting, uh, among most of the relatively impartial people whom I talked with, and very hard to find such people as toward the end, uh, <coughs> was that the <coughs> Congress would probably get in the neighborhood of 230 to 250 seats. In other words, less than a majority of the 542, because they increased the size of the Lok Sabha, the 542 seats, elected seats of the Lok Sabha, but still <coughs> enough so that with the, the um, uh, CPI, uh, which was uh, in some cases supporting Congress candidates, in other cases opposing them, by the way, in this particular election, with a CPI and with a, a few uh, parties, of, uh, a few state and local parties with which it was affiliated, uh, like the DMK in, uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu, which was expected to get more than, what is it, one seat that they got, uh, <coughs> and a number of other groups like that, and a few independents that it would be probably possible for Mrs. Gandhi to continue, for the Congress government to continue, with a very, very much reduced majority from 350 members of Congress alone. And that would probably give Mrs. Gandhi uh, a little bit of needed humility <coughs> and would perhaps uh, lead her to change her ways and to, uh, to restore the, some of the uh, uh, democratic practices that had existed uh, um, before under hopefully happier conditions. Uh, and in general, Mrs. Gandhi would stay in. I mean, that was pretty much the general feeling. But uh, of course, there were some who uh, said that, no, the Congress is going to be uh, defeated but I don't think it, any of those in their wildest moments expected <coughs> what happened. I mean, I don't think anyone could have conceived that the Congress party uh, in UP, for example, Uttar Pradesh, which had won 73, 71 or 73 seats in 1971 out of, out of uh, 85 seats, would win not one seat, <coughs> including Rai Borelli, where Mrs. Gandhi was the candidate. I don't think, I think Rajnarayan himself was surprised <coughs> that, he, that he beat Mrs. Gandhi, and he certainly was, uh, I don't think he's recovered yet from the shock of that, <coughs> that, that, they, that they got, that the Congress didn't get a single seat in, in all of UP. And not only that, but Congress didn't get a single seat in that whole area. Not one seat in Bihar, incredible. Not one seat in Delhi, where they got all seven before, or six or seven. Not one seat in Haryana. Well, that's a little bit easy to understand in view of Bansi Lal. <coughs> <coughs> I hope I'm not stepping on any toes, by the way, of people who come from these areas. <coughs> and, and, and so on. And, and only one seat in Rajasthan. And uh, you know, one seat in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, three seats, I believe, in West Bengal. I mean, this is absolutely incredible. I still don't believe it. So Mr. Gandhi and I share a similar feeling. <coughs> But I heard, for example, the, the head of the Gallup Poll Organization in India, uh, Mr. Eric De Costa, the head of the Indian Institute of Public Opinion, who had made uh, uh, rather accurate uh, uh, predictions based on his sample survey techniques on some of the previous elections. He made a little mistake once or twice, but not, not very badly, within a 3 or 4% margin, which is usually permitted, I think, in, in, in polling, even in this country, a place where it's easy to do it. I heard Mr. DeCosta in my presence uh, take a wager that uh, the Congress would get at least 250 seats. <coughs> well, Congress got 153 seats. That's a fairly considerable margin of error, I would say, for the top pollster <coughs> of the country. <coughs> but he was smart enough, I give him credit for it, after he took a few of his uh, famous sample surveys in different parts of India, particularly West Bengal, which is enough to uh, confuse anyone uh, <coughs> in the pol political side, he was smart enough not to give out any general prediction this election and simply to call attention to some of the trends that were emerging, uh, including such trends as the fact that uh, never before in his polling experience had you had so many people who said they were undecided. Well, the fact was, of course, that it turned out they were not undecided. They just weren't going to say they were anti-Congress for, uh, for 
various reasons. So <clears throat> I would say anybody who tried to predict this election uh, should still be looking, licking his wounds and sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Now, <clears throat> the results of the elections I don't need to remind you of. I think you're quite familiar with it. The, uh, there's almost a, a, a reversal of the 71 election. For example, in 71, the Congress got uh, 43, 44 percent of the vote, but the great majority of the seats. In this case, the opposition got uh, about 43 percent of the votes and, uh, and the majority of the seats. If you put the, uh, uh, the janitor and the CFD and some others that were in the opposition uh, together, whereas the Congress Party, which had always got between 40 and 50 percent, uh, got 34.5 percent of the votes. And of course, they had always had uh, uh, many more seats than the 153. In fact, some, some wags now are saying, well, we're, we're worried about this prospect of a two-party system emerging. <coughs> we're sure that the opposition can do it. What about Congress? Uh, they're so badly off that they can't even be a party. Well, that, of course, is absurd. <coughs> the, the Congress, after all, has 153 seats, which is a very substantial number in the, uh, in the uh, uh, Lok Sabha. And I wouldn't count the Congress out. The Congress is going to be an important opposition party. And if, as is likely, the coalition government begins to fall apart or not to do the job, uh, then the Congress is available. <coughs> now, <coughs> one, one very impressive thing to me is that uh, apparently in India, in spite of the, uh, of the damage that may have been done to the political system and to whatever democratic practices there are in India during a period of 19 months. In spite of that, I say, apparently what had seemed to be established, namely the routinization of political change, has in fact been established and has survived the emergency. <clears throat> because after all, there was a peaceful transfer of power uh, without much uh, real likelihood that Mrs. Gandhi would take some kind of action in an attempt to reverse or to destroy uh, the results of the voting. And I think you have to conclude simply on the basis of the results, if for no other reason, that, uh, that on the whole in India, the elections were free and fair. Mrs. Gandhi, I think, would agree with that. <coughs> I mean, if they hadn't been, if, they, if the election were not free and fair, I can't imagine the Congress would have done as badly as it did in this particular election. Whereas in the case of Pakistan, it's just the opposite. <coughs> Almost prima facie, they couldn't have been free and fair because the, P PNA, the uh, PPP couldn't possibly have got uh, <laughs> virtually all the votes <laughs> as it did <coughs> uh, in, the, uh, in, in the elections when there was a strong wave in Pakistan too. <coughs> See, one of the intriguing questions is why is it that two very powerful waves, and I, I felt the wave as strongly in Pakistan as I did in India, this anti-government, anti-authoritarian wave, why was it that in one case the, this anti-government wave did not get translated into votes, whereas in the other case it did get translated into votes? I think the reasons uh, would be fairly deep-seated and be very difficult to explain. So that what you had in India after the voting, of course, uh, was that <coughs> you had a complete change in the sense that the, the end of this long period of Congress rule unless, as I say, Congress is still there in another form, which I would say. Uh, you can think back nostalgically, if you will, to 1885 when the Indian National Congress was established and all through the long period of, you know, Gokhale and Tilak and Gandhi and Nehru and all the rest of them, <coughs> through the struggle for freedom, into independence, and through the Nehru era and the Shastri and Indira Gandhi era, and the, the, the period of continued Congress uh, dominance and, uh, of Indian national life in the, in the political sense, and, and shed a tear or two at the, what seems to be the end of that long, uninterrupted period of unquestioned mainstream uh, Congress dominance. <coughs> you can shed a few tears if you want to about the end of the Nehru dynasty, and, and going back to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Joala Nehru's father, and uh, Joala himself, and uh, Mrs. Gandhi in her better days, and all of that sort of thing, and say what you will about Sanjay again. But <coughs> Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a change, certainly, a very, a very important change in personality and perhaps in orientation and in direction. 
If I were to mention, and I'll do this quickly and then try to end, uh, some of the main factors in the Congress defeat, I think I would tick off at least the following. Uh, I would start out, as, as I have already, with, uh, with the hawa, the wave. There were, there were two words that were kicked around in India, hawa and nasbandi. <coughs> and hawa refers to this wave, the, the strong anti-government wave, which is so strong in the north of India. And then I would move immediately, and it's very much associated with the wave, a consequence of it, the reactions against the excesses of the emergency. All the way from uh, this feeling about the loss of freedoms to all kinds of real or alleged abuses at uh, local levels. And of course, <coughs> here I would throw in two or three things which perhaps should be mentioned as specific factors. Obviously, the forced sterilization program was a, a really big factor in some parts of North India. And it certainly was a major factor against Sanjay, who rightly or wrongly was associated with the way in which, uh, rather ruthless uh, uh, way in which these uh, efforts were made in certain parts of certain sections of North India. Although I'm sure that we haven't got the full story of that, and I suppose it will come out as, uh, as time goes on and we'll get a more balanced picture of how widespread that was. Another thing, for example, <coughs> the forced removal of uh, uh, workers from the central parks of Delhi to the outskirts, and that had one to other places, uh, did not gain votes for the Congress. Uh, a great deal of uh, ruthless, brutal treatment by petty officials and, and police who apparently felt encouraged that this is what uh, they were now uh, able to do and, uh, and, and, and get away with. That, <coughs> that was mentioned many times. I heard many complaints about that. Uh, about that myself. <coughs> I mentioned the defection of Jajivan Ram and all of its consequences, and the fact that the opposition was able to achieve a high degree of unity and to keep uh, united to a remarkable degree. I have referred several times to Sanjay Gandhi, and I have to refer to him again. Uh, one of the very prominent left-wing leaders of the Congress whose name would be known to all of the Indians present at any rate, uh, told me before the election, before the election, this is an anti-Sanjay election. This is a Congress left-wing leader, remember, not, not an opposition. Uh, <coughs> he said that before Jajivan left the Congress, my telephone was not ringing from Delhi at all, whereas for some time it had he'd been very close to the centers of power but that as soon as Jajivan left the Congress, my phone began to ring, ring madly. And what happened was that <coughs> Mrs. Gandhi was really shaken up by Jajivan's defection, then <coughs> began to turn to some of those elements in her own party, particularly what I've called loosely the left wing, the, the group that Sanjay was against. You know, anyone who, who in his judgment had uh, any kind of communist associations or affiliations or something like that, and that included a fairly large number uh, in his mind. She turned to <coughs> some of the more prominent of them whom she had cold-shouldered or worse, perhaps under Sanjay's prompting, and uh, urged them, and in some cases apparently almost begged them, you know, to come home, all is forgiven. And <coughs> she assigned a number of them to fairly responsible positions in supervising and directing the campaign of the Congress in certain parts of the country, notably in the South, well, the Congress did very well. I'm not necessarily ascribing a cause and effect uh, relationship to that, <coughs> by the way. I've also mentioned the remarkable role of Jeff Kashtan Ryan and the contribution that he made certainly uh, to the, uh, to the uh, Congress defeat. And another point which I've not developed, and I, I won't, but it's a very important one, and that would be the uh, divisions and dissensions within the Congress party the lack of organization of the Congress, which really dates back to the 71 period or before, and Mrs. Gandhi was so successful in bypassing the regular vote brokers and the regular machinery of the party at the district and the state levels and things like that. They never really put it together again. It had become increasingly centralized. And also, even the top organs of the party, like the working committee even, had been uh, oftentimes sort of bypassed in favor of a more highly centralized type of decision-making uh, sending around Mrs. Gandhi, her son Sanjay, 
and some of the members of our own secretariat are some of our particular uh, advisors. Now, <coughs> I'm not going to say anything because of lack of time about the aftermath of the election. You, you're generally familiar with it because it's been highly publicized, uh, rightly, uh, in, in, in the news. I mean, having uh, a, a, a new government, uh, presumably uh, of a different uh, type, established in power, presumably marking a different direction from the course that India was uh, embarked upon and seemed almost irretrievably embarked upon. Remember all this talk about the end of democracy in India and things like that. Uh, new faces, a, a new mood in the country, uh, but one has to say continuing problems which uh, still have yet to be faced. That is, there's been so much uh, uh, politicking in the recent weeks and months that uh, one gets the impression that the new government has got to try to capitalize on its honeymoon mm, period while it can and begin to do things that will genuinely appeal to people. Because my guess is that the people of India have, uh, have again learned an extraordinary le lesson. Namely, well, we really do have some power. And if this government doesn't produce the goods, they may be bounced out too. And they, now they know how to do it. Uh, it. It's quite conceivable that that will happen. It doesn't follow that, that, if it, that if it is bounced out that, say, the Congress will come back, particularly the Congress under Mrs. Gandhi, although I wouldn't rule that one out either. I mean, you might have a, <coughs> a shift in the controlling group and another reorganization of that sort. But my guess is that short of a, a much more radical kind of genuine radical situation in India than seems to be actually in existence, or remarkably, that it'll be, it'll be done uh, through this routinization of political change technique within the system. Whereas you see, in, in Pakistan, when, when you, where you have not had this routinization of political change, you don't know if the political change does come, as almost certainly it will now, whether it'll be within the system, or within whatever system emerges, or whether it'll be by the kind of techniques that have to be followed when you don't have a peaceful arrangements for, for political succession. It seems to me that India has again, uh, uh, has, has again given us some evidence to believe that uh, whatever the pros and cons of a particular government, and it doesn't matter too much whether you like the Congress or like the emergency or like the present government or not, that whatever the kind of government there is going to be a government in which the people of India are going to have a fairly considerable say in its formation uh, and, and in whose political future uh, they will continue to have a very significant voice. Thank you.